give some credits to folks. Most of the photos, especially the bad ones on this, are going to be my photos. But uh, got a few photos from the Sacramento Audubon uh, website uh, that uh, photographers have shared for educational purposes. And then also uh, Roger Jones um, of the Bufferlands and our uh, tech guru and all around good guy. Uh, some of the photos are his as well. So um, I'm just gonna get, get going. So this isn't gonna be uh, in an hour. I can't do a comprehensive talk on all the birds of the Bufferlands, but um, you know, this is going to be a little more than a quite a bit more than a sampler, but not a comprehensive discussion. And these are, uh, you know, probably have seven or eight talks that we could harvest out of the material that just uh, this is based on. But these are just some ideas that I've found interesting over the years. And, you know, it's been my uh, real good fortune to have been at the Bufferlands. Now, this July, it'll be. 24 years, and it's uh, this is no doubt you know the strangest year, but it's still um, you know the the being able to be outside and and see nature and and birds and wildlife are uh, you know one of the things that is less different than other aspects of life. But you can probably see I haven't had a haircut in in quite some time. But um, though I sometimes would forget to do that uh, back in uh, the pre-COVID days as well. So 244 species, and uh, I would just like to think of it as, uh, you know, the pretty amazing diversity of habitats on what on the surface looks at, looks like, uh, you know, pretty similar area. Now, it's not huge, uh, but you put in the, the treatment plant um, and it's about 3,500 acres total property that I'm, I'm covering, even though it's, you know, we work for the buffer lands, uh, we also work for the treatment plant. And that's really the reason that our team is there. And, you know, in addition to just having a, having a fun job, being able to be outside a lot, I, you know, really fortunate to work with a great team of, of people, most of whom have been there actually longer than I have. I'm one of the newbies that, you know, going on 24 years. And then um, we've got uh, great volunteers and also just a lot of the regular uh, field trip uh, participants and people who come out to our events, you know, that I've gotten to know over the years. It's just been, you know, a, a really nice community that's built up around, around that. So um, the buffer lands moving in a, a little closer. Um, you know, we've got uh, I-5 on the west, Franklin Boulevard on the east, uh, some decreasing ag land. As you can see, this is an older photo that was taken before Delta Shores and Kissimmee River Boulevard went in. But uh, Laguna Boulevard at the south and a little off screen to the west is the uh, Sacramento River. And the wastewater treatment plant uh, services, you know, a huge area, well over a million customers, most all of Sacramento County, plus uh, part of Yolo County. Uh, all the wastewater comes into the treatment plant and is treated on site. And it's you know, the treatment plant itself is undergoing a big overhaul right now, and that, that could be another talk or two in and of itself, but I wouldn't be giving that talk. But then the, uh, the solids, um, not to be too graphic, they're uh, stored on site in these uh, big 40-acre fields, and then the uh, liquid portion is uh, treated and disinfected and pumped into the Sacramento River. And the reason that the buffer lands is here is because of the wastewater treatment plant. There were a lot of little plants scattered throughout the county, and then they consolidated the effort so as to not have, uh, you know, as I think Roger has said many times, you know, nobody wants to live right next to a treatment plant. So they, 
they consolidated the effort and uh, put it out in the middle of nowhere at the time between Sacramento and Elk Grove. And now all of this development to the northeast uh, and east and south, nearly all of it has, has uh, come in since the treatment plant was initially built. Um, that was in the 70s, and it, it really went online uh, fully in the early 80s. So we have this open space buffer surrounded by uh, a development and even more development than this picture shows. But some of the features we have, uh, even though it's uh, relatively flat going from about sea level uh, in the west, uh, up to the nosebleed elevation of about uh, 22, 24 feet on the east side. But there's uh, quite a bit of difference. We have these uh, big managed seasonal wetlands and then some uh, emergent marsh uh, up here in the north, and then some more managed wetlands in the east, and a lot of grasslands and an old uh, gravel pit. Uh, and a uh, constructed wetland experimental site, this 22-acre site, uh, which has a lot of, uh, from a bird perspective, has a lot of uh, emergent marsh vegetation, and then some uh, grazing land, and over the years there's even and been a little bit of uh, crop, of uh, uh, hay crops grown on the property. So one of the big components of our, our efforts is the managing the seasonal wetlands for uh, water birds, uh, primarily waterfowl, but also shorebirds and then herons and egrets that use it as the water drains and concentrating the, the fish and other uh, you know, crayfish and things that, that they eat. And so we manage it uh, with uh, manipulating the water levels to the extent we can. Uh, when we get a lot of rain, because uh, Sacramento, the Sacramento River has, um, I'm just going to go back here. So we, we have Morrison Creek coming, coming in and then Laguna Creek coming in from the east. And they join together and then flow into the Sacramento River, which is over here. But because of the levees on the Sacramento River, they have to, that has to be pumped into the river. When there's a lot of flood water coming down, the water will will sit out here. And sometimes you can see it from I-5, or some of you have probably been out on the property on tours where there's been a lot of flooding. So, um, you know that that limits the extent to which we can can alter the the water levels. Sometimes it just goes beyond what we can do. But we do manipulate it in a way to uh, encourage vegetation that produces a lot of uh, seeds for the uh, ducks and uh, primarily ducks to eat. And uh, then we also do things like, you know, mowing and other agricultural practices to, uh, you know, encourage the vegetation. And then the crop instead of the seeds is secondarily is the ducks. And one of the things the west side is really known for are the large numbers of diving ducks. And this is one of the years where we had about 15,000 canvasbacks. And in recent years, we've had fewer canvasbacks, uh, mostly in the, in the hundreds of canvasbacks, but more ringneck ducks. And those are the two species that we tend to get in good numbers. Uh, and these are diving ducks. And I'll, I'll get into that a little bit more really soon. But they're, you know, these two are attractive ducks and always fun to see. And they come in, they, they arrive from their breeding grounds uh, down here when the, when the water level is, is right. Uh, ducks are, are always pioneering new habitat. And sometimes you know, we'll flood these seasonal wetlands purposely for the ducks and you get a rain and it creates new flooding. And then some of the, the ducks will actually leave and go check that out. And so, uh, you know, you really get a feel for what it must be like uh, for a duck to see the wetlands. When you get up in an airplane, you can actually see, uh, you know, quite a bit of the water features in the region. And I imagine they're, you know, when they're up in the air, they're they're looking for new areas to uh, to feed and, uh, you know, that are safe to 
spend the night. So this is often what it looks like through your binoculars. There's a good number of ducks. This is the lower cell of Upper Beach Lake looking north toward downtown. And uh, by the whites on the sides there, they look mostly like canvasbacks. You zoom in a little bit more and you can see these are a, lo a lot of male canvasbacks. Down here in the lower left, here's a, a female canvasback and the males. And then this bird here, uh, hopefully you're seeing my, my uh, cursor here. This is a uh, redhead, which we only get, uh, you know, we're, we're lucky. To, we don't get them every year, but sometimes we get up to four or five. And uh, we've got ruddy ducks here. And there's another uh, ringneck duck over here on the right. So lots of ringneck ducks. Uh, these uh, males are really, you know, quite attractive, and they have this distinctive um, white spur near the front of the sides, and then it's grayer, and is contrasted with a lesser stop, which we see less frequently. Um, but you know, we we get them. Um, I've seen a few lesser stop out on the among the ringneck ducks this year but I haven't yet seen any uh, redheads. And uh, usually for the males with the scop, I'll be scanning through, looking for the, the white sides as contrasted with the, that white spur and the gray sides on the ringneck duck. And the one thing that, that gets me nearly every day when I'm scanning through ducks is the, uh, when you have, you know, we've had as many as about 2,500 ringnecks uh, out there so far this year. And when they're scratching, they'll turn on their side and show their belly, which is white. And I'll think, oh, there's a there's a lesser scop. You know, there's the the uh, white side of the lesser scop, but it's just the belly of the ringneck duck. And then the the female scop are similar looking to the female ringneck ducks, but they're they're a deeper brown and they have more contrast at the at the base of the bill here than than the uh, ringneck ducks do and then here's here's another ruddy duck up here so been talking mostly about diving ducks so far but we have our uh, the two broad categories of dabbling ducks and diving ducks and dabbling ducks, as the name might imply, they dabble near the surface. Uh, there's some also called puddle ducks. You'll find them in smaller bodies of water, sometimes just a few inches deep. And they'll just be at the surface, uh, kind of looks like they're nibbling at the water. They're getting, uh, you know, seeds and, and a floating vegetation near the water. And they'll also get uh, in invertebrate organisms that they can um, handle. And they during the breeding season, especially, they shift a lot more to invertebrates. But um, so then the diving ducks are in deeper water and they do a lot of their foraging by, as the name implies, going completely under the water. Uh, a couple features that you'll notice uh, are in behavioral features. The dabbling ducks uh, have their legs positioned farther forward on their body. And they're they're good at walking around on the on the ground. The the diving ducks are less agile. Their legs are actually positioned farther back on their bodies to facilitate them swimming underwater. And that helps the having the legs farther forward helps the like the mallard, a dabbling duck, push up off the water and take take off straight in the air. Uh, with the exception of the, the buffle head, which is really tiny uh, and can just take off the air, the, the diving ducks pitter patter across the water. Uh, a lot of you are probably familiar with coots doing the same thing. Um, so just go through a, a few. Oh, one other thing I wanted to mention. The dabbling ducks tend to have this bright wing patch uh, called a speculum, and it's uh, which just means mirror and it's uh, iridescent, and uh, most species of, of dabbling duck have, have a bright 
uh, wing panel here, and it's uh, distinctive. And you can you know, learn the wing patterns on, on waterfowl and uh, get you a long way towards IDing them. Uh, the diving ducks, for the most part, are are less uh, have less flashy wing patterns. So go through mallards, we know pretty well. Uh, Northern shovelers, another dabbling duck, and they're really have interesting adaptation. Sort of almost have uh, like baleen, like whales do, but in their bills and on their tongue, and that helps them, um, you know, siphon out food from the from the surface and they they are getting a lot of invertebrates out of the water and it's pretty amazing you'll see big blocks of shovelers sometimes um, you know kind of pumping the water through their bill and and collecting the invertebrates from the water column and the males and a lot of these ducks are really showy and the females are a little more cryptic and the thought is that it helps them when they're on the nest and they're less likely to get you know, noticed and eaten by a predator, but the males are showy <clears throat> because they're displaying to females. So oftentimes it's the shape and the overall impression, as well as the wing pattern on the females, which will usually look a lot like the male's wing pattern uh, that helps you with the ID. And some others are uh, gadwall. Uh, they're a uh, rather bland looking duck on first impression um, and you're sort of grays and browns but you get a good close-up view of them they're they're quite beautiful and really intricate patterns no, called vermiculations on their feathers we've got uh, northern pintail they're one of the more elegant uh, ducks we have and these are doing a very typical foraging behavior in the back. Uh, they call tipping up, and they they uh, forage either right at the surface or by doing that most of the time, whereas the divers are going underwater. And you can see the female on the left is very similar uh, structurally to the male. You know, they're they're a more slender duck with a, a pointed tail, and it's even longer on the male. American widgeon is another uh, dabbler. They, though they spend a lot of time out of the water grazing. And sometimes you'll find you know, the snow geese and the white-fronted geese and then a bunch of widgeon with them and they're all grazing out in the field on the, especially this time of year as the new grass is coming in and growing really fast, they spend a lot of time grazing. Green-winged teal are one of the more, more stunning of our birds. Um, just, you know, the males are, are really pretty. Uh, here, a couple of a sleeping male and female pintail on the left side. Cinnamon teal and blue-winged teal are actually most closely related to shovelers, uh, but they don't have the uh, extreme adaptations that the shovelers have. But they're uh, very closely related to one another. And uh, the blue-winged teal is sort of the, the eastern counterpart to the cinnamon teal. But the blue-winged teal is showing up in more and more numbers out in the, uh, out in the west. And as there's a pond in, in West Sacramento called Bridgeway Island Pond that sometimes has over a hundred uh, blue-winged teal, and that's very unusual. There was a rare gargany, which is a old world version of a blue-winged teal, and it was in with the uh, blue-winged teal uh, two winters ago. So uh, wood ducks are kind of their, their own, own thing. They're uh, really showy. And most of the ducks that we have, that we've, uh, I think all of the ones we've talked about so far, nest on the ground, but the wood ducks nest nest in tree cavities and also uh, in wood duck boxes. And it's one of the things that we do to enhance habitat is uh, put up and maintain uh, these wood duck boxes, which is uh, kind of a big chore. Um, you know, you can, 
out walking in various parks and streams, I'll often see the remnants of wood duck boxes. You know, people put them up with the best of intentions and then you see them without lids and or without sides or without fronts. And so it's a constant, you know, uh, every day, every year effort to uh, keep these maintained. And they also provide nesting habitat for um, barn owls. And uh, if it's a little more exposed uh, in the open, uh, American kestrels will use them. We found nests of, uh, of uh, ash-throated flycatcher in them a few times, and even uh, house wrens. And house wrens will fill the entire thing with sticks. You know, you think it's one stick at a time that they're filling these things, and they they have a little tunnel through the sticks that they can get into the box, and and, and you know they don't need a very big area because they're a tiny bird, but they will uh, you know use one of these uh, wood duck boxes as a as a tree cavity substitute. We're less happy to see some of the non-native squirrels in there like uh, fox squirrels and then uh, even maybe less excited to see uh, rats that sometimes are in the box and when one time i opened a box up and a rat leapt out and landed on my chest and then went in between the buttons of my shirt and went inside my shirt and this then popped out fortunately my shirt wasn't tucked in or I would have had a, a more of an exciting time because it, it got away. So these are both uh, cavity nesters, and neither of them have yet nested on the property. Though we expected the hooded mergangers will. They're, uh, they've been using wood duck boxes in increasing numbers. And then the uh, common mergangers uh, show up on the property in wintertime. Uh, this shows some breeding birds that are actually kind of near my house along the American River, uh, some chicks with a female. And this is a male with a huge fish, and all these others are are trying to get it. And he was having trouble staying away from these guys and swallowing at the same time. Ruddy ducks uh, are very, uh, quite a bit different than the other ducks. They they behave like divers, but they're sort of their, their own thing. And they uh, are different in that they they don't get this bright, ruddy, uh, rusty color with the bright blue bill until uh, into the, well into the spring. Most ducks are at their most showy, uh, you know, starting in November, December, and they're uh, displaying to female, the males are displaying to females and they're pairing up. But the ruddies don't get colorful until like some of the songbirds that you think about. And down here, you can see what they look like, uh, you know, when they show up in our area in the fall. And even now, most of them look like this. And the males have the brighter white cheek, and then the this is a female in the back. It's just she has a less bright cheek. But otherwise, in the winter time, they're pretty similar looking. Uh, geese are uh, you know, very common on the property, especially the Canada geese. And these didn't used to breed locally, uh, but now we have a, a year-round population of Canada geese. Uh, in my opinion, a bit too many. But uh, And then Kathleen geese are the small version of Canada geese. And we get them sporadically on the property. But down in the Delta, they, you get thousands of them, like down at Staten Island Way. And then uh, snow geese and uh, greater white-fronted geese. Uh, we're, getting, we're getting thousands of greater white-fronted geese on the property now. And 10 years ago, that was a rare occurrence. So these are really increasing. And they've been increasing down at Kasamnas River Preserve as well with good numbers of snow geese. And then we also get a few of Ross's goose, which are a small version, about a, just over half size version of a snow goose. Going on with some other water birds, uh, we have uh, pied-billed grebes. These guys uh, dive, uh, dive underwater for fish and they nest, nest on site. Uh, whoops. Uh, American coot. This is a 
really interesting bird though it's often overlooked they're a member of the rail family most members of the rail family are secretive birds that hang out in cattail and tule marshes but these are often out in the open kind of an honorary duck and they have these really interesting feet that have these fleshy lobes on them and when they they help them propel them through the water kind of like the webbed feet on a duck but as they, they move their foot forward in the water, it collapses down. And then when they, they uh, pedal backwards uh, to push forward, it'll fan out and uh, give them more surface area to move them along. And then these are the true rails, uh, the Sora and the Virginia rail, and then the type of habitat that you find them in. And, you know, you, you kind of have to be out a fair amount to see them. You hear them more often, but they're definitely uh, can be quite secretive. Though, uh, starting about now and then the, for the next uh, couple of months, they're uh, you know getting ramped up for breeding, and they're a little more uh, noticeable because they're a little less cautious. Sandhill cranes are uh, also. You know, when I first started here, we never saw them on the property. Uh, we saw them flying over, but not on the ground. And now we're seeing them quite a bit. And they're even some of the, just the other day, uh, my coworker Steve saw about 270 flying out of Fishhead Lake in the morning. So they spent the night there. So that's that's pretty exciting. Most of the birds we get on the property are greater sandhill cranes. And this is the uh, state threatened uh, subspecies. And that's the banded individual on the right. And we've uh, recorded a couple dozen uh, banded birds with these codes that, and then report them. And they uh, most, I think all of them actually have come back that they, they uh, were hatched in uh, uh, Modoc National Wildlife Refuge, so Northeastern California. Then on the left is a lesser sandhill crane. They're smaller and they have a little more uh, of a rounded head and not quite as long and droopy a bill. In the air, these are all uh, graders with a kind of a long, slightly droopy bill and a, and a more uh, flattened forehead. Moving into our uh, herons and egrets, um, great blue heron, is our, our largest uh, in the heron family. And uh, just about every continent has a, has a really big, um, you know, big heron. And the great blue heron is our version. And great egret is just a little smaller. And <clears throat> egret and heron are sort of, uh, the, the names don't really mean that much. Usually the pale birds are called egrets and the um, darker birds are called herons for whatever reason. The uh, snowy egret and the great egret are less closely related than they're in different, uh, they're in a different genus, whereas the great egret and the great blue heron are in the same genus. So it's more just a description of color than, you know, don't get hung up on that name. Um, this is a photo off of the from Sacramento Audubon uh, member Vicki Campbell, and I just like this photo because it's a good contrast between the great egret and the snowy egret. And the snowy egret is about half the size, and then has the dark bill and the uh, yellow feet. Uh, sometimes you'll read they call them golden slippers, and they I mean, they're fun to watch foraging because they. Uh, swish their feet side to side and either to flush up prey, you know, like tadpoles and uh, other uh, small fish. And this is one that was out near my house uh, on the American River um, in, in the uh, mosquito fern or um, Azola. And it, you can see the pattern that it was making as it forged around and as it walked it was just constantly kind of shuffling its foot quickly side to side uh, the the other white egret is the cattle egret and it's uh, 
a lot less common locally, but um, has it has a really interesting story. Like so many of these topics I bring up, it could be a talk in and of itself. And the cattle egret is certainly one. They are uh, they've colonized the Americas on their own, not with human assistance, at least not direct human assistance. Uh, probably getting a flock or two getting caught up in a storm and it thought they got went from Africa to South America. And then perhaps perhaps because of clearing of land uh, by humans, it made parts of South America and then as they um, made their way north, uh, you know, more attractive to them. And also the the uh, cows that weren't native to uh, you know South America are sort of like you know um, wildebeest in in Africa. And they they will follow the herds around, and the the cows or other large uh, large herbivores flush up insects, and the and the egrets will will catch them that way. And this is one that came in, and these cows were not uh, conditioned. So I like to say that uh, this is a cattle egret, but these weren't egret cows. And I apologize to some of you. I know you've seen this video a couple times before, most likely, but uh, I just can't get enough of it. So if I if I have to force you to watch it once a year, I enjoy seeing it. And I don't know how the videos come through as far as uh, sound. I've got just a few more videos throughout the talk, and they're, uh, some are a little bit windy, but we'll, um, uh, you know, you just bear with them. They're just a few seconds long each. And speaking of windy, I think I'm going to need to pick up the pace. Uh, so we've got our uh, uh, great blue heron and great egrets, both of which nest on the property. The last tour we were going to do that got canceled back in March 14th um, was our rookery tour. And so, uh, you know, I don't know, maybe. Uh, 2022 rookery tour. Here we come. Hopefully, we'll have other tours before then. Uh, and that they're they're fun to watch because you get the the young uh, great blues and and great egrets, and then also here up in the upper right the great egrets with their uh, breeding plumes. And those were uh, you know, a lot of you know uh, these birds were shot and collected for these and the for those plumes for for uh, wear and hats, and they were, um, you know, drastically reduced in numbers, and and it was one of the things that led to the creation of the National Audubon Society uh, was to protect. That's why the great egret is is their logo. But these birds, uh, you know, they nest in in these big colonies. You can see the multiple nests in the treetops here, and it's a good. Good protective, you know, many eyes and from concentrating the effort, breeding effort. Uh, and some you also will get uh, sometimes black crowned night herons and double crested cormorants uh, mixed in and you know near good feeding sites. But that behavior, which was such a good adaptation, uh, you know, didn't work too well when people uh, were able to go after them. So you know, some of the, the earliest uh, conservation laws in the country were to protect these uh, breeding colonies. Also in the heron family is uh, American bittern, which uh, stalks around secretively in the cattail marsh, almost like a rail. And then even more so is the least bittern, which we haven't seen in a number of years, but it was one of our uh, several claims to fame at the Bufferlands is seeing the recording the first least bittern in Sacramento County. Nowadays, I think Mather Lake is the best place to find them. We used to have more water going up to the constructed wetlands and they were regularly seen out there, but they've uh, 
uh, with the less water, uh, summer water going out there, we're uh, not, not seeing them regularly. The uh, white pelicans are kind of an amazing bird, and I've got a little almost photo essay on them just because I started selecting photos and I got caught up on how interesting the white pelicans are. They have the uh, largest wingspan of any North American bird other than the California condor, and the condor only beats them by a few inches. So it's about a nine foot wingspan. They're just a huge bird, and they're here next to a double crested cormorant, which is not a small bird, but they make it look small. And uh, there's a couple interesting things about them. Uh, you see the black on the the like the outer half of the flight feathers and that's uh, structural pigment it actually helps reduce feather wear you see that on a lot of white birds that, uh, like gulls and uh, snow geese uh, most all of the long distance flying white birds have black pigment to reinforce uh, and the feather is actually a little bit thicker uh, because of that pigment but uh, you know the tundra swan is one I can think of that doesn't have that, but almost all of them do. And then just uh, you know, interesting. This bird was for whatever reason maybe trying to choke some food down, kept opening its bill, the one on the lower right. And then you can, speaking of bills, you can see that uh, fibrous plate on the on the bill. They only get that during the, the breeding season. They don't breed here uh, locally, but they do, uh, you know, show up in what looks like breeding condition. But we most we get them any time of year, but especially post breeding when we have enough water, uh, you know, in in the late summer. But uh, really, any time of year, we can have decent numbers of these white pelicans. They used to breed down in the Tulare Basin, but they uh, they don't any longer because it's been uh, just altered so much down there. They do breed in the in the Great Basin and Pyramid Lake, uh, northeast of Reno. Uh, they'll often gather in rings and swim together to uh, kind of corral fish. Um, this scene, we also see some of our uh, ring neck ducks again. Um, and I think my screen's a little cut off. Uh, but yeah, there's a ruddy duck off to the off to the side as well. We did once, actually twice, have a brown pelican on the property, which is uh, these are almost exclusively coastal, but occasionally they wander a little ways inland. Double-crested cormorants are uh, another one of the colonial nesting birds that we have. They're uh, more closely related to pelicans, uh, not not related to the herons and egrets, but they do uh, nest with them. Uh, you can see why they're called double-crested cormorants, as they have these tufts on either side of the, the head, hence the double crests. And then they, they forage by uh, diving underwater from the surface. And you'll see mergansers do this too, uh, and uh, where they'll uh, look underwater uh, presumably for fish, and then when they see something, they'll they'll go after, swim underwater, and catch them. Uh, moving over to a new group of the shorebirds, the the plovers and sandpipers, and then a couple of uh, other interesting groups. I'll get to. Here's a killdeer. It's a you know very common plover that often will nest in uh, on gravel roads. You can see the eggs under the bird. And every, uh, when another month or so, we'll have to, when we're driving the gravel roads, be careful, uh, you know, looking for them. And they make a lot of noise and we'll do the uh, broken wing display to um, you know, distract the potential predators. So uh, we try to avoid running over their nests. Uh, this group, the recurves, uh, is in their own family together, the stilts and avocets, and um, they're uh, nesters on the property. These are stilt chicks uh, and a pair of avocets uh, up above. The 
migratory shorebirds are, are one of my favorite groups. Uh, it just kind of blows me away that these guys will nest up in the Arctic and then come down here and uh, pass through in migration. Uh, the least sandpipers are, are here almost year round, even though they nest up in the Arctic. You can find them from uh, late, uh, late June all the way through winter and into the middle of May uh, around somewhere. And some of them may just, uh, you know, not go. And then the Western Sandpiper, they winter uh, mostly along the coast and farther south, but occasionally we get a few strays in winter. But this is one in breeding condition. I know people get, they say, oh, I don't do shorebirds, they're too hard. But actually, you learn these two and you can see the differences. Uh, uh, just, you know, spend a little time with them. And, and most of the small sandpipers that we're going to get here are going to be westerns and leasts. And then a little bit bigger are the Dunlin. This is how they look as they're getting into breeding plumage. They get much darker, uh, darker black bellies and reddish backs. And then this is what they look like this time of year, uh, pretty drab. Uh, and they're about twice as big as the small sandpipers. So uh, they're a lot of fun to watch interacting, even though it seems like, you know, the mud and sludge is, uh, there's plenty to go around. They, they'll they squabble quite a bit over feeding sites. And you can see how much, uh, especially in the spring, as, the, as we draw down these seasonal wetlands, uh, you know, people might wonder why we do that. Well, I've mentioned a little bit before, but if you came in late or just to reemphasize, you know, it's to allow the vegetation to grow out here and to manage it to produce a lot of uh, seeds for the waterfowl in the wintertime. But, you know, a, a secondary benefit is it creates a lot of mud flats that the, the shorebirds will use and they probe in the mud or in some of them with shorter bills, just pick at the surface of the mud. And then also they'll, you know, can fly back and forth between there and the uh, the um, sewer ponds. And this is a, a different kind of sandpiper in that they're in our area year round. They're migratory in some parts of their range, but they most of the year, at least when I'm taking people on tours and stuff back when we used to do that. I'd say, oh, look, a spotted sandpiper. And, you know, I, I really like these guys. And uh, one of their characteristics is they bob up and down a lot. And then when they fly, they just flick the tips of their wings and they look like they're not going to make it across the water. But somehow they do. And, you know, some of them that breed way in the north, you know, migrate, you know, hundreds, if not over a thousand miles that way. And I mean, they probably fly a little more efficiently when they're really going. But when they fly, you know, 100 yards or so, it, it looks like they're barely going to make it. Uh, and then I, I'll i point out spotted sandpiper and people are like, well, why do they call it that? It doesn't have any spots. It only has spots in the uh, in the breeding season. And like this uh, haiku that uh, Kimball Garrett uh, came up with, he's the curator at the a Los Angeles County Museum an ornithologist, and he did a haiku book of all the birds, regularly occurring birds of California. And, uh, you know, it's uh, never spotted in winter, but often seen. That's the uh, spotted sandpiper. It's hard, uh, these talks. I know you guys are probably uh, holding your sides laughing, but uh, when, when you're doing a talk in person, you get some feedback from the room. So I'm I'm hoping I've been going for over half an hour. You know, I don't see Roger waving his arm, so I assume that my sound is is going through and all that. But it's uh, it's a different experience to do a virtual talk, that's for sure. But anyway, um, I'm gonna again try to pick up the pace here, but it's hard. These birds are just so so interesting. There's so much to say about them. But we have uh, greater and lesser yellow legs. These are on that kind of that same time frame where they breed uh, up in the Arctic or just just below the Arctic in the taiga, these guys. Um, and they uh, will show up in you know June and July 
And uh, one thing I didn't mention about the sandpipers, uh, the same is true here, is the adults will take off and leave the, the young once they're fully grown. And then the young make the migration you know, from Alaska down here on their own. It's, it's pretty amazing. You can see the greater and lesser yellow legs and the um, lesser uh, has a, a it's smaller, it's about the size of a killdeer where the, uh, they're about 10 inches long and the uh, greater is about 14 inches long. So the, the size is, is uh, different if you have a measuring stick, but you know, killdeers make a convenient measuring stick for shorebirds because they're around a lot. But um, you know, you can also see on all dark, more straight bill. These have a pale-based upturned bill, and then we get greater yellow legs of at least a hundred to one in our area. So lessers, uh, you know, sometimes you'll find a little flocklet of them, but usually you're lucky to find one. And graders, we find quite a lot. Uh, this. Slide is from Alaska. This is a lesser yellow legs singing from the top of a tree. Uh, you know, in the breeding season, these birds are just a different different animal. And uh, you can get a little bit of a feel for that by going up somewhere like uh, Sierra Valley, uh, north of Truckee, on the east side of the Sierra. There are willets and snipe that uh, breed up there, and they'll sit up on the fence posts and call. So it's uh, you know, you get a feel for it, but up in the Arctic, these birds are amazing, and the the uh, little sandpipers that breed up north of the, the the tree line up in the tundra, they will do a lot of singing from you know they they'll fly up like a skylark and hover in the air and sing. It's a amazing different experience that you don't get down here, but uh, it is part of their annual cycle. Uh, Long-billed doucher is another one of our common shorebirds, and you can see how they might like kind of little forceps when they they're probing in the mud that they'll uh, pick out uh, little organisms. And here's a video just showing how how uh, flexible the bill really is. And sorry for the wind noise if it comes through to you. Whoops. Let's try that again. So and here's a another uh, really, you know, I I think this is a beautiful bird. I know uh, beauty's in the eye of the beholder, but uh, you know, I'll show a western tanager in a little bit. But this is uh, you know just cryptic, but just such a charming looking bird, and they're quite skittish and they can really blend in. But when you get it get a good look at them in good light, there's uh, you know. Sniper, just a wonderful bird. And these are, uh, they don't breed in the immediate area, but they do breed in uh, marshy meadows up in the Sierra. And they have uh, interesting uh, song, you know, uh, what they call winnowing, which actually made by uh, feather noises that they fly around. So uh, again, you know, we see them hunkering in the mud but they have a much more interesting life cycle than that. Uh, and then another, another interesting bird, I keep saying that, but they all are, uh, are the Wilson's phalaropes. There are a few breeding records locally. And uh, one thing about them that's, that's cool is the uh, females are the colorful ones and they uh, court the males and they'll they'll breed and then she'll lay the eggs and then that's his job and she goes on to court another male. I'm not sure how many times they can do that in a season, but uh, two or three at least. And uh, it's just a different different uh, approach uh, called polyandry or uh, multiple males uh, instead of polygyny, which you probably hear about more. But the uh, spotted sandpiper is also polyandrous, but the males and females look more or less alike. So I won't spend too much time on gulls, but uh, you know, some people make a life out of studying gulls, and I'm not one of them. But 
you know, a lot of people just give up when they see a gull. But if you can learn these three species around Sacramento, you'll probably have 95% of the gulls you're likely to see. And they're not, they're not impossible. The uh, herring gull is the, the largest. And these big pink-footed gulls, there are a lot of species that actually uh, interbreed quite a bit. You know, you can argue make it really easy. All the big pink-footed gulls are the same species, but that's making it a little too simplistic. But you can see the difference. The, these two are a little smaller with the uh, California gull being intermediate and with the dark eye. You know, it's a little uh, kinder looking, even though I'm sure they would they would pick you apart if they could. Uh, and then this guy's kind of a menacing looking bird. So those are actually field characteristics that you can always see uh, and uh, help you um, identify them. But you can learn these three birds. You'll, you'll be on your way to learning some more about gulls. Close relatives of gulls are the terns. And the, here's a Caspian tern. Um, we've had some with bands that we photographed, and I actually just put this on my Flickr page, and the researcher found these uh, and could tell me where the birds were banded, even though it's not all that clear. I can't remember this individual, but it was either the Columbia River mouth up in Oregon-Washington border or uh, San Francisco Bay. There were two populations that we had. And uh, they don't breed in the immediate area, but they'll come with the juveniles that are still begging. We'll follow these around for obviously at least tens of miles away from their breeding locations. So um, kind of the avian calendar, a lot of this I have alluded to already. But you know, when you're, you're thinking about the different different ways in which uh, you know we experience birds throughout the year uh, you know there's a lot of excitement around the colorful songbirds during spring migration and then fall migration is something that uh, is actually more extended there are more birds to look at because there are all those young birds that uh, uh, you know you have more chances at but they're often a little less showy and then you have birds like the Swainson's hawk that come and they breed in the, uh, you know, they're, they don't spend, not many of them spend the uh, summer or the winter here, but they show up in the spring. Uh, I've talked about the pelicans already. We have some birds that we consider year round residents, though they will actually vary a fair amount. We'll get, um, you know, we'll see red tailed hawks all year but there is a big influx in the winter time and some of them are migratory and some of the birds are year round residents. And then the winter residents like the sandhill cranes that show up, um, you know, in the, in the fall and then spend um, the winter months with us. And just, you know, I've talked about spring migration, you know, starting as early as January and it's, you know, the basic idea is the birds that are arriving uh, to breed is spring migration. So uh, in this instance, uh, I'm thinking of the uh, tree swallows that start showing up in big numbers in, in mid to late January. And right now they're, they're singing their heads off and checking out nest boxes and tree holes. And then, um, as I talked about earlier, you know, the fall migration, the Shorebirds will show up as early as um, as early as June, and you know some of them are still moving into early uh, December. And uh, you know the wren tit is the classic uh, year-round resident, where um, you know they're unless they have to move, they won't. So I'm really going to need to pick up the pace a little bit. So um, you know, I just, uh, I always do this and I even, I cut about 40 slides out of my talk and I'm still uh, up against it, but I'm gonna try my best to pick up the pace here. So just going through some of our raptors, here's a uh, red-tailed hawk. 
that's a I immature red tail. Uh, so it doesn't have the red tail, but it has this dark, uh, dark leading edge and the belly band. And I have a few more photos to illustrate that. And the Swainson saw, what I was trying to illustrate here is just that these are bar charts from eBird that show the seasonality. So here's your typical of year round resident and then your, um, your, um, your more summer resident that are pretty much gone in the winter time and then start showing up in spring and are here steadily through the summer and early fall and then leave again. And then our, one of our winter residents, and I usually try to start thinking of them more in the fall because that's when they arrive in our area. And these will breed up in the Sierra, but they uh, start showing up in our area in decent numbers in September. And then are with us in really good numbers all the way through uh, April and then start tapering off into May. Uh, more year-round residents are like the morning doves, which sort of like what I was saying with the uh, red-tailed hawks is they they uh, are here year-round. You'll always see uh, morning doves, but they actually within the population move around quite a bit. And so with banding uh, studies, and we've we've taken part almost 10 years now, and you can see that some of these birds move all the way down into northern Mexico in the winter. And even though, you know, unless they're marked, you just assume it's the same uh, morning dove, but they, they move around uh, quite a bit. And they're, uh, you know, really good at utilizing human habitats. You know, some animals have very specific needs, and then others, like the morning dove, are, uh, you know, just very well adapted to uh, human environments and will even take take advantage of a stoplight or a go light in this case. Uh, Eurasian collar doves have moved moved into the area and are quite common and they built up to good numbers but have now uh, really uh, you know they're fairly steady at this point uh, even tapering off a little bit. So there was some concern that they would swamp our morning doves, uh, but they haven't. Um, here's a red tail hawk, nice adult red tail uh, with some of the features I was talking about before um, with the dark leading edge and the red tail. Here's an, another adult red tail. And then here's a young bird. Um, it takes them about a year to get their red tail. and uh, But they're distinctive compared to the, some of the other uh, large raptors, and I'll get to that really quickly. Um, we've already seen that picture. Uh, this is just to illustrate the uh, difference. The, the males are smaller than the females. So you see these pairs, and you'll see this the size dimorphism. So Swainson's hawks, um, they're a state threatened species, and we spend a lot of time monitoring Swainson's hawks in the uh, breeding season, especially if there's any construction projects on, on the treatment plant or uh, any of the outer facilities. Uh, we'll go and make sure that uh, there either there are no uh, Swainson's hawks or that we are able to uh, you know, figure out a way with consultation with fish and wildlife to uh, work around them. Unlike the uh, red tails, you know, they're not modeled on the back. They're really dark. They have, they're highly migratory and they have longer wings to the wingtips uh, project beyond the, the tail. Here's a, uh, an adult with a couple of young birds that have left the nest. They, uh, this is really common with birds, even after they've fledged, you know, songbirds and and raptors, they will uh, move around with the adults, and the adults will feed them for a while, and then um, you know they'll they'll have to learn to hunt on their own. A beautiful uh, red-shouldered hawk. Just kind of go through these a little more quickly. Uh, kind of a survey of, of the birds that we have. Uh, there's our Northern Harrier, the female on the left and the male on the right. 
Cooper's hawks, these are uh, primarily bird predators. So the Cooper's hawk uh, on the right and the sharp shin hawk on the left, these are quite difficult to tell apart. If I had another hour, I would get into that, but I won't. But you can see the rounder head and smaller, bigger eyed look and the more angular head and this uh, uh, gray contrast. Uh, white tailed kite. Uh, this is an interesting story in that the bald eagles, we never had bald eagles, uh, you know, 20 years ago. And we had occasional golden eagles. And we're still getting occasional golden eagles, but bald eagles are getting much more common. And now we see bald eagles more often than we see uh, golden eagles. And bald eagles have started nesting in the region. Uh, the uh, American kestrel, so a little falcon. Uh, the the males are uh, distinguished from the females by the this uh, slaty gray on the outer edge of the wing and the dark barred tail. But it's uh, a distinctive uh, to you know you be able to tell the males and females apart, which you can't on a lot of birds of prey. A little short video, and this was another windy day, but it's just cool how the the uh, bird keeps its head still in the wind. Another little falcon that we see just occasionally on the buffalo lands, but they're, you know, uncommon but regular in the region. And they're, they often, you often find them, I think this one has a white crown sparrow. Um, they're often with birds. Uh, peregrines and prairie, and this is sort of like the, the uh, golden eagle, bald eagle thing. We used to almost never get uh, peregrine falcons, and we'd see a lot more prairie falcons, but now it's the other way around. We're seeing peregrine falcons all the time, and uh, prairie falcons less less regularly. Our turkey vultures. I apologize, I'm going to just have to kind of keep rushing through these uh, at this point to, to finish and then have some questions. Um, so, Barn owl, um, great horned owl, they both nest on the property. Burrowing owls, a species we've done a lot of work with. We've built artificial burrows. Uh, they've declined a lot in the region, and we still have a small population on the property, but it's, it's smaller than it used to be. Even though we're doing more work for burrowing owls than we probably ever did, um, here are some uh, one of the artificial burrows, and uh, they're just a, a real charming bird. We get an influx of them in the winter time, and then um, you know a few will stick around to breed some years, but not every year anymore. And we used to have quite a few breeding pairs, and that's just been the story of them in the region for a lot of complicated reasons. Some that aren't aren't completely known. Some of our, um, our uh, introduced uh, species, ring neck pheasant and wild turkeys. Wild turkeys we didn't have at all until I think 2001, and now we have hundreds of them. So that's a big change locally. Uh, let's move over to talking about grasslands briefly. So, um, so one of the classic grassland species is the loggerhead shrike, and um, they have declined in part uh, because of development in the region as well as uh, they're susceptible to West Nile virus. Uh, some more of the grassland species. Uh, this is a great photo Roger got of nesting shrikes. Um, all of these birds are declining. Most of the development that's happened in the region have has been uh, at the expense of grassland habitat. So these these are birds. Some of them, like the meadowlark, are still 
very, very common, but they're much less numerous they were even than they were in the region even you know as recently as about 20 years ago. Uh, American pipit, this is another uh, kind of fall through early spring uh, uh, grassland and open country and edge of wetland bird. These are among the most numerous this introduced species, and they they roost in really high numbers on the uh, uh, in the treatment plant, some of the process area. There's been a lot of talk in recent years about uh, murmurations. People get excited about that. It sort of became a thing, as they say. Uh, and here's a, a little bit of that. Among that is also will be brewers, blackbirds, got our red wing blackbirds, um, which are will nest in the wetlands as well as in you know areas like tall mustard. Tricolored blackbirds, we don't have nesting on the property, but they do uh, move through, especially in the spring. Quickly through some woodpeckers, We've got our northern flicker. This was kind of cool. This bird was uh, soaking up the sun on an early cold morning. And right nearby, there were a couple of gray squirrels that were doing the same thing. Our downy and uh, nettles woodpeckers. And there's a little quick ID tip for you. If you can't see the barring on the back, and especially the female nettles don't have any red on the head, so they can be hard to tell apart. The white spot in the back is distinctive on the downy, but what if you just see it from the side? The face pattern is different. So you can see this, this white stripe is enclosed by black in the rear, and here it keeps going. And then here the white comes down all the way around like this. And on the downy, the black continues back to a central black stripe on the back. So you can tell them apart even if you can't see their backs. And as hummingbirds, they're already nesting. I've seen some eBird reports with pictures of uh, Anna's hummingbirds on nests. They're, they and great horned owls are really early nesters. Uh, black chin hummingbird is the other common hummingbird here. Um, black Phoebe, uh, this is a young bird. Uh, they nest, they're year round resident nests locally. This, a lot of young birds, you'll see this uh, yellow gate. And you can also see some kind of buffy feathering on a little bit of the wing that's uh, typical of young birds. Uh, these two open country flycatchers, they sort of, uh, you know, are complements to each other. These are the, these guys show up in, in toward the end of March, just after these guys leave. And then uh, these guys will leave again by early September. The kingbirds are gone, you know, down into Mexico, to spend the winter, and the Sace Phoebes will be back. Uh, one thing, kind of a new change, is the Sace Phoebes are starting to uh, breed uh, locally. Survey of our swallows. Just going to kind of buzz through. These are the swallows that nest a lot on buildings, these cliff swallows, and even if you're driving I-5, you'll see all the nest colonies on the on the sides of the overpass. Um, our other species, th these the barn swallows with the the males, especially with these long tail feathers and like swallowtail uh, butterflies or swallowtail kite, which is a raptor in the southeast. It's named after the tail of the barn swallows. Yellow-billed magpies are our local specialty and they have um, declined a lot but more or less stabilized but when West Nile came in the area in 2004-2005 their numbers really cratered. Other uh, birds in the crow family are the uh, California scrub jay. 
don't know what I was thinking. I was going to, I have a little um, story about each one of these, but you know, I know you guys don't want to be here all night. So I'm just going to keep uh, kind of rushing through to, to the end. Uh, I have a couple things at the very end and then uh, we'll open it up for questions. Um, but here's the uh, common ravens have moved into the area uh, in decent numbers. Uh, and they used to be, you know, 20 years ago, you just didn't see them locally. And they can be a challenge, ID challenge between crow and raven. And, you know, see something like this, you, you can't believe you'd mistake it for a crow. But sometimes if you don't see them well, you know, you need need to spend a little time. And things like tail shape and behavior, the ravens do a lot of soaring, uh, kind of like a, a raptor. And the crows don't do that. They they flap all the time. So that's a helpful uh, ID hint. And also their their voices are different. I'm going to move quickly through some woodland birds. Hey, these are actually my favorite birds, and I always give them short shrift when I do this talk because I've run out of time. Uh, the house wren and Buick's wren are common wrens in the uh, year-round residence. And uh, again, it's a little complicated because I say year-round resident, but the house wrens do some migrate, but there are some here year-round. And um, the uh, bush tits have the tiny little birds with a big nest and big families. And in the fall and winter, several family groups will create big flocks and then they will um, often be the core of a mixed species flock through the winter time. And it's a great, uh, great way to find other birds is look and listen for bush tit flocks and then comb through them because they're, all their eyes and their vocalizations, warning vocalizations, are a good safety strategy for other birds to join in. And from here, I'm just gonna, gonna rush through just sort of as a visual for folks to see some of our other birds. I'm not gonna really say much more about these until I get to the end. Just sort of a, a sampler of, of what we, we see. Usually in a, any given year, I'll see about 190 species on the buffer lands. So that means, uh, you know, 50 to 60 species are, are quite rare. Almost all the ones I've, I'm mentioning here are uh, fairly common birds. So they're in, the, in that 190 group that we see every year. And nearly every year we'll add a new, a new bird. Uh, just quickly on the sparrows, you know, we, they're, they're again another really common bird, but they're only here uh, September through early May, the white crowns and the golden crowns. The exception being the song sparrow, and I always really like these guys because they keep me company in the summertime when I'm out, you know, working on irrigating, uh, planting, or uh, you know, trimming back some willows from the roadside or whatever I'm doing out in the field. And the uh, song sparrows don't abandon me. They're here year round and they have a beautiful song and hence the uh, melodia of their specific epithet because they're great singers. Lincoln sparrow, one of my favorites. Um, they're another wintering sparrow as are fox sparrows. And I always think of hermit thrushes along with fox sparrows because they're in the dense thickets uh, and they're spotted. Of course, they're not closely related. Got our finches. It's been a really good year for purple finches and pine siskins. And you can tell just really quickly the look at the female um, house finch, the kind of muddy uh, brownish gray face. And then on the purple finch, even though it's not a great photo, you can see a much crisper face pattern. So the, I think the female purple finches are actually easier to tell apart from house finch than the males. So our um, gold finches, the lessers are bright year round, but the Americans get a uh, drab, kind of that buffy color in most of the year. And then just in the spring are the, that really bright 
uh, bright yellow, that upper right bird. One of my favorites, the blue grosbeak. There's a female with uh, nest material. These nest in, uh, you know, people fixate on trees is where birds nest. A lot of birds nest on the ground and maybe even more nest in just scrubby edges. So kind of these weedy fields are really vital habitat that is underappreciated. And it's one of the many things I like to harp on is just how important those uh, weedy type habitats are for birds, along with grasslands. You know, it's not all just trees and wetlands are what get the top billing, but uh, these type of weedy fields are, are great and you know important for such an amazing showy birds like blue grosbeak. Um, got black-headed grosbeak as well, and then the beautiful western tanagers. So western uh, Wilson snipe or western tanager, you know, very different, but depending on your tastes, you know, I, I like them both. Uh, really quick, uh, you know, people ask, you know, what's the most uh, exciting bird you found on the property? And I'd probably say least terns. Uh, it was the first uh, Sacramento County record back in 2008. They nest uh, in the in the gravel roads in the treatment ponds, and I know some of you have come out and seen them. And here's one with some little uh, little chicks. It's very short legs as they hobble around, but they're they mostly nest uh, right along the the coast and in the San Francisco Bay. And uh, in recent years, this has been the only nesting either one or two pairs that have nested here in the Central Valley. The only nesting in the Central Valley. So uh, as I mentioned before, 244 species, and here's our new species since 2016 and i've told people often that i when i would get to 250 then i can retire but until then i'll have to just keep working at the buffer lands which is uh that's okay with me uh an interesting thing we did had this year is we were contacted with a rehabbed uh, uh people wanting to find a place for a rehabbed burrowing owl so we uh uh, introduced it uh, to a uh, one of our artificial burrows and it spent about three weeks and then it moved on and uh, Stan Wright uh, put a, a coated band on it so we could identify it so hopefully it found another good place and um, you know maybe someone will report it but you know it's this is just an illustration of how it's a, a rough world out there one morning a couple days after we uh, released it uh, into the burrow, a uh, Cooper's hawk was looking into the entrance hole and the owl was inside. And then, uh, you know, once the Cooper's hawk flew off and the, the owl came back out. This is just a illustration of uh, what it was like this, uh, you know, August and September with the fires. This is a, a photo of some white pelicans on Black Crown Lake during one of those uh, horrible smoke days. And this is a really cool uh, 2021 thing. Uh, we have a uh, some researchers doing a great tail grackle study on the property. And they're studying uh, several uh, subpopulations of these birds in different parts of their range. And here in Sacramento area, we're on the leading edge of the expansion of great tail grackle. So they've really been expanding into the United States, especially the western half. And they're, they're trying to figure out what are the characteristics of great tail grackles that make them uh, good, uh, good uh, you know, pioneer species. Uh, and you know, one of the hypotheses is it's their their behavioral uh, plasticity or their ability to adapt 
And so they've uh, captured a few on the, well, just adjacent to the property actually. And they uh, ran them through a battery of tests and they're going to be putting uh, radio uh, locators on them and following th them through the breeding season and kind of really try to figure out what's going on with these uh, this species and what uh, is it about these pioneering species, these successful pioneering species that um, you know kind of make, make it work. And if you want to see more about that in a talk that actually gets in and they're uh, just under or just over an hour, I think, unlike me, uh, is on the Yolo Audubon Society. If you just Google their web page, uh, over on the right hand men drop down menu that has their YouTube, uh, and there, there's a talk on the uh, by uh, Kelsey McCune, who's one of the researchers, does a talk on the great tail grackles. It's really cool. Other resources, and I know most of you know about this if you found out about the uh, this talk is our website, has our bird lists and a lot of other information. And then at long last, I think I have reached the end. So uh, we'll unmute folks. And I see that most folks stuck it out. Yeah, I'm not going to unmute everybody, Chris. If anybody has a question, they can unmute mute their self would pro probably be best. Sounds good. So, uh, yeah, just questions. So, uh, go ahead. Yeah, yeah, we loved it. Uh, Kathy, especially, really loved it. Well, wonderful. Uh, I have a question. Uh, is there any way that you could put this uh, expand that you could expand this talk and, and put it? On, on your website so that we don't have to miss out on what you weren't able to say because of time constraints this evening. I, I thought you had lots of valuable information and you probably could have contributed a lot more had you had more time. So is, is that a possibility? Yeah, it's certainly something we um, think about and maybe um, you know, do uh, smaller chunks uh, or more uh, targeted, uh, you know, targeted species groups or habitat types and, uh, you know, over time kind of fill in those gaps. I have a question. Yeah, I think that would be good, Chris. If we maybe thought about it, we, maybe we did the waterfowl and, you know, and the, the hops and so on like that. But yeah, we should talk about that. I did want to point out, though, if anybody hasn't found the, the chat feature, um, if you go up in your top right corner and find and click on it, I put a link to one of the videos that we had put on Facebook, which I think it was about 100,000 of the starlings that day that did a really pretty memoration. I took all the videos from um, outside our office door. It was a few years ago, but it's a pretty cool video if you click on it. Um, hope, hopefully, hopefully it will open for you. Yeah. So I saw a uh, chat question that popped up, and uh, it was what was the difference between uh, hawks and falcons? And there, uh, actually, now there's been a lot through DNA uh, that's been learned that they're not all that closely related. Hawks and falcons are uh, two different evolutionary groups, and uh, and uh, structurally they they have evolved to be very similar. Uh, you know, it's a case of convergent evolution. There are some structural differences. Like the bill shape is a little different. The uh, falcons have a thing called a tomial tooth. And they no. will often kill their prey by biting the neck and severing the, the spinal cord. But they are more closely related to, to uh, parrots and, um, than uh, they are to hawks, for instance, the falcons are. So, uh, yeah, it's only been in the last 10, 12 years that a lot of this has become more widely known. 
I also saw a question about uh, the salmonella with pine siskins. You know, the recommendation uh, lately has been to uh, take down bird feeders, especially and especially if you see any sick birds and people are feeding them on the ground. Uh, but, you know, there, there has been some mixed thoughts on that because the bird, the pine siskins are a bird that uh, they have a, a characteristic uh, a called er, eruptive behavior. And so uh, they and other finches, it's a part of what's going on with the purple finches as well. They, um, you know, stay near their breeding grounds if they can, and they stay up in the mountains, for instance. But if the the cone crop is less than you know less than they need to survive the winter, then they'll fly out and search for food sources, and uh, so they're finding bird feeders. But the downside of that is they congregate in big numbers, and if you have uh, uh, birds with uh, disease, any disease, then they, you know, it gets wiped onto the feeders and then other birds will come into contact with it. And so it's recommended just as general good housekeeping to clean your feeders periodically. And then, uh, you know, I'd say, you know, check the websites too for, for recommendations on uh, like the, I've seen some uh, recommendations have been sent around about feeding pine siskins. That's later the question. That's later the question. She's getting me done. And maybe she's put to uh, maybe she I just want to thank you very much, Chris. It's just been a wonderful, fascinating talk and your knowledge is so extensive. It's very impressive. Well thank you very much. You know it's such a fun topic that um you know, so I was in Davis the other day in the backyard of a of a couple who just had a, a broad-billed hummingbird that showed up. And these are birds that are in Mexico and barely get into the United States in southeastern um, Arizona. And one showed up in Davis, and they have just a few records in California. And I was talking to the guy, and he's not a birder, <laughs> and he just got binoculars uh, for his birthday, and then they found this bird, way rarer a bird than I've ever found, you know, out of sight. Uh, and I was just telling him how fun a hobby it is. It's just a uh, there's so much about learning about birds. Because when you learn about birds, you learn about geography, you learn about the seasons, you learn about conservation issues, um, and they're always with you. Uh, you know, you be in uh, a traffic light, and you'd see a you know, Cooper's hawk going after some pigeons, or you know, hear a mockingbird singing, or whatever. It's just uh, a great thing to be aware of. So, uh, to me, uh, you know, it's just been uh, coupled with my time at the buffer lands has been sort of this immersive learning experience that just keeps going on. So I always tell people, you know, sometimes they say, well, how do you know that? Or how did you learn those bird songs? It's like just getting out and doing it all the time. And if you love it, it's really easy to uh, learn it over time. Is there any Oh, Chris? Yeah. Chris, I have a question. Yeah. Hi, this is Laura. Um, I was wondering, um, you said something about your Flickr page? Yes. You talked about your Flickr page. How would I find your Flickr page? You could probably just put in Flickr like the bird, but without the E. It's just, uh, you know, an R at the end with no E and then my name. Chris Kennard, oh, and you'd probably find okay. it that way. Uh, okay. I've seen the because I, I was. Off. Oh, sorry. Um, I just no, I, I saw just, another. I question. didn't know if it was. 
please. I saw a question pop up about the difference between shorebirds and waterfowl. And usually uh, waterfowl, we just mean ducks and geese. And then shorebirds are like sandpipers and uh, plovers and things like long-billed curlews and the uh, avocets. And then, um, you know, so that that's the basic difference. And they're not closely related groups of birds, but they do often utilize a similar habitat or many species of shorebirds uh, are found in the same areas that the waterfowl are. May I ask a question, Chris? Absolutely. Hi, uh, my name is Greta. Um, hi. Hi. This is the first time I've been introduced to this group or this or this um, beautiful buffer lands. I'm excited about touring it and seeing it. Have you seen any um, difference in bird populations and migrations due to the big wildfires that we had last year in Oregon and Washington and in various spots in California? Have you seen an impact? Not really on the buffer lands that I can think of off the top of my head. I, I've heard uh, different accounts uh, around Davis, they were seeing a lot of band-tailed pigeons, which are normally up in the coast range, which is up uh, you know, where the LNU fire hit, uh, yeah. in Poudre Creek Canyon around Lake Berryessa. So they were seeing, uh, you know, bandtail pigeons down on the valley floor where they're rare, but um, you know, otherwise, I'm sure there were things going on, but uh, not that I directly observed. Thank you. Hey, Chris, this is Jim. Yes. Uh, you know, in past years, we've had uh, many goldfinches at our feeders, and uh, this year, there have been very few. Do you have any thoughts on that? Goldfish, <laughs> brilliant. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not sure. Um, you know, sometimes they will. They'll find a food source and they'll um, just stick to that. It's it doesn't fun. seem like goldfinch numbers overall are are in a big decline. Um, but. I'm I'm not sure. You know, some species like dark-eyed juncos uh, are are much less common than they used to be, uh, but the goldfinches seem to be still in in about comparable numbers in my experience. Hey, Chris, this is Ian, one of your devoted docents. Yes. A good question here from Dan Steele about access dates for for tours. Should they, where would where would people find that when when we find the open again? Well, we'll have it on our website, and we have our our email list. Uh, a lot of you are over a thousand people on the email list, so we'll definitely be keeping people, uh, you know, be keeping people up to date that way. Um, I know perhaps through their face group. Facebook group as well, but certainly the uh, email list and the website. Yeah, okay. And fingers crossed, right? Fingers crossed for a, a real yeah, live tour. This, yeah, maybe this summer, um, you know, we'll just, you know, do it as soon as, we love doing the tours, you know, as soon as it's safe to do it, we'll be, uh, and we get the green light from, from the district to we will need that and then we'll we'll go ahead. Good. Good. Thank you. Thank yeah, good you. job to good job to have where your fan club is clapping. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, thank All you, right, Chris. Thanks. That was great. So if, is there anyone with a, a burning question that I didn't didn't address. I haven't been able to look at all the chats. Chris, there is one about any suff looks like any impact from the residential areas around around the Buffalands. From Dean, question from Dean there. Um, any impact? It says resistance to the refuge from the residential areas growing oh. up around. Good question. You know, we re we really haven't. Um, I think. 
you know, my my sense is that the the neighborhood has been very uh, positive toward you know love it <laughs> just as a resource even if they don't visit just having some open space around and um you know if any conflicts ever come up it's with uh, mosquito control you know kind of pressuring us to get the water off the wetlands before we raise uh, mosquitoes um other than that I, I can't think of any I can't see that. <clears throat> well, I think we've we've about covered it, and I really appreciate everybody uh, joining joining us. And uh, thanks to Roger, and thanks to um, you know Brian and the Bufferland staff, and all you regular folks who are uh, joining us. Um, you know, it makes it a lot of fun to do. So it, it makes it like it's no work at all. That was great. Thank you, Chris. Thank you. Thank you. Roger. Thanks.